today, uh, right now, the world is in the clutches of a pandemic and an economic depression. There is a global psychological depression as well, which is stemming from the recent trauma of recent events and the loss that everyone seems to be experiencing as we make our way through an extended period of sickness, isolation, and quarantine. Many people, many people feel subsumed by catastrophe, and some regard what's happening as uh, catastrophic change that's uh, preceding something good, a greater evolution, perhaps. Um, no matter what your perspective is, you would be hard-pressed to find somebody who's not disturbed by what's going on. Um, and there's so much fear and confusion about many of the facts and uh, of what what is to come that uh, um, we have uh, invited a, a guest today to help us uh, look at some of this. Um, our guest is Marjorie Golden. Dr. Golden is an associate professor of clinical medicine as well as the site chief of infectious disease at the St. Raphael campus of Yale and Haven Hospital. Uh, she is also the Northeast co-chair of the American Academy of HIV Medicine. Dr. Golden has been recognized as research attending of the year twice for her work in supervising medical residents on their clinical research projects. She has also received the John Vecchio Award for Outstanding Clinical Teacher. Um, welcome, Dr. Golden. Good morning. Good morning. So uh, just straight off the bat, did you ever think you would be so involved in two pandemic two pandemics in your lifetime? So when I was a medical student, we were smack dab in the early days of HIV infection. And the things that we were seeing routinely as medical students and then subsequently as a house officer isn't anything I could have imagined when I was in high school and college and thinking about uh, becoming a physician. And so having lived through unprecedented times once before. Um, I don't think I expected it to happen again, but I can't say I'm surprised. And we have had several warning shots fired across the bow over the years with concern about avian influenza and then the first SARS epidemic, um, which mostly was in Canada, but I had several colleagues who went there to respond to that. And then of course, very recently with Ebola. And so I can't say that it really comes as a big surprise that we're facing this now. And when you explain it that way, I, it, it doesn't come as a surprise to me either, except uh, I'm not an expert in the field you, uh, as you are. And so as I uh, hear, hear you uh, talk about it, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's quite fascinating that, that you actually have had a finger on the pulse, so to speak. Um, well, I, I think for the layperson, um, most of us wouldn't string all of that together, even though we may have read about it in the news. Uh, we're living more uh, heuristically, you know, in the moment, it's just moment to moment, the most recent uh, memories that we have are the ones that inform us. And I think it's really hard for people who didn't live through the HIV epidemic in the early days when virtually everybody died. And we just have a short memory and we forget. And we have dodged many bullets over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and unfortunately, I think we've really let our public health infrastructure collapse. And I think mm. that's a very important part of where we are, where we are today. Would you... Uh draw any similarities between what happened with HIV and what's going on now with the coronavirus uh, in terms of how people are um, acting, how they are uh, reacting? So I can really only give you my personal experience with this. I think there was so much more fear and stigma in the early days of the HIV epidemic. And, and saying that, I need to immediately add the disclaimer that there is still a significant amount of stigma for people who are living with HIV infection. Hmm. But I think the, the fear and the stigma that early patients with HIV infection faced is not, uh, is, that it far overshadows what people who are living with COVID um, are facing now. 
I think there's much more sympathy for patients who are suffering with COVID than there was in the certainly in the early days of the HIV epidemic, where mm. there was a real sense that people who got HIV had done something wrong and um, sort of deserved what they were getting. There was just it was really a horrible time with a lot of stigma. And I think again in the early days of the HIV epidemic. Um, there was a lot of fear on the part of healthcare workers about whether they were going to become infected. Whereas I think with COVID, we're already seeing that with appropriate use of PPE, healthcare workers um, are not getting infected at high rates. Um, and again, that's with the disclaimer of appropriate use of PPE. And we've collected data at our institution that is incredibly reassuring that with appropriate PPE use and social distancing, our healthcare workers, thankfully, um, are not being infected in any significant numbers. But something that is happening that, that's uh, really significant is that uh, whether a, a proper PPE use is, is being uh, um, done or, or not, uh, the healthcare workers themselves are also being exposed to the trauma of the event that is, in fact, uh, affecting them too. In other words, uh, everyone seems to be developing very serious um, um, sort of symptoms, I would say, from from the... Correct. Yeah. So there's, correct, that's an important distinction of physical illness versus mental health issues. Right. And I think everyone who's dealing with COVID patients day after day is really starting to feel a strain. Um, and is really feeling exhausted. And so yeah. there, there are a lot of efforts. And again, I can only speak to the institution that I work for. There's been a lot of efforts to, to try and support the mental health of everyone who's involved. So not just the nurses who are really the frontline people. Um, and then, you know, the physicians, especially the ICU physicians, emergency department physicians, but everybody involved in the teams, environmental services, people who are often really overlooked for the incredible contributions that they make, and the food service people. Everyone's just exhausted. Yeah. It's interesting because, uh, you know, there's been some coverage of that, and New York Times has done a couple of pieces. There was a piece recently on some of the trauma and PTSD that's being experienced by nurses. There was also, um, there were some photos accompanying one of the articles in which one of the nurses was quoted as experiencing some hostility from people who, who reacted and saying, well, you know, this is what they signed up for. It was uh, something like that. And she said, uh, when she was in nursing school, she did not sign up to be uh, taking care of people in, a, in, in this, in a pandemic. Um, and, and she would, you know, had, that was her way of explaining the exhaustion and the, the uh, impact that you were just describing. Correct. Um, and family members can be very angry, understandably, when their loved ones are critically ill, dying quickly. They can't, they often can't be at the bedside. And I mean, the nurses always are the ones who are on the front lines dealing with that. And, you know, I think it's lovely all of this incredible outpouring of thanking our heroes and supporting the nurses, but there are still way too many nurses on the front line who are just getting vitriol from patients and you know seeing people die every day. And while our overall numbers are going down, we still are seeing incredibly long length of stays for patients on ventilators and a lot of those patients still are not surviving. And, you know, it's just incredibly stressful for the nurses who've poured so much into the care of these patients and then see them not survive. Our ICU numbers are way up from what we typically see. It's exhausting work on a good day. And the numbers are up. They're, it's just exhausting. And I imagine you probably don't spend that much time with an individual patient, but have to continue about. Uh, Correct. Yeah. Correct. So again, and there's a real distinction between what ICU nurses and intensivists do, where they're responsible for smaller numbers of patients, right. versus an infectious disease consult service, where we may be supporting 
you know, at our peak of COVID, we had over 40 patients that we were trying to support where our normal inpatient census would be, you know, anywhere from 18 to 25. Um, so we obviously can't spend as much time with any individual person or family. And I would imagine when you do, uh, there's often desperation and uh, they want some answers from the doctor, so to speak. Is, 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 that, is that right? Um, you know, I think, um, again, the nurses are always the ones on the front line, but we, we do spend a lot of time talking to families, talking to other physicians, mm -hmm. trying to answer questions and trying to allay fear. It must be awful to know or have some idea of how this pandemic moves, how, or how, I should say, how the virus moves and how uh, the pandemic is evolving and be meeting with family members who are hoping you're going to give them some information about something concrete that can be done right now and, uh, and, and not be able to. It's, I think one of the real challenges, especially uh, maybe a month or two ago when we were much earlier in our understanding, um, I and I'm sure all of my colleagues were inundated with phone calls and emails from friends and family looking for really concrete answers that nobody had the answers to. And, yeah. you know, we were just all being inundated with information from different sources, often contradictory. We were trying to have meetings every day, sometimes twice a day, to sift through information and make treatment decisions to try to put forth some sense of a uniform, well thought through plan, which was incredibly challenging because the information was changing constantly. So it was incredibly challenging. Yeah. So uh, you feel that you've, that the, the, that everyone has arrived at a plan in some way now where things yeah, are, so are? I think we are in a much better place on many levels than we were, you know, even a month ago. So, um, for example, we have a team that puts together the treatment algorithm. And so that's been in place since really the first week or so um, of who was going to get which medication or which series of medications. And that algorithm has evolved multiple times over the course of the last two or three months. So, you know, there's been a tremendous amount in the press about hydroxychloroquine, which was recently taken off our algorithm for lack of efficacy and concern about safety. One of the HIV um, protease inhibitors, which was on our algorithm early, was removed after data was published, again, showing lack of efficacy. Um, hmm. Remdesivir is on our algorithm, but there's an incredibly tight supply of it, and so we can only give it to select patients. And another medication that we use to kind of damp down what's called a cytokine storm, which is just this burst of too much inflammation in the body, um, we, may, we have to make treatment decisions about who's eligible for that medication because of availability and cost. And so those algorithms are changing, but as we get more and more information, we can make better decisions based on the science that's available. And so I feel like we have an excellent handle on that based on um, the data that's available. Well, that's very encouraging to hear. It seems that there's a dis discrepancy with the incredible attention that you and your colleagues are paying to uh, what's going on and the public at large, who it would seem at any given moment there's a mix of, of people who are taking this quite seriously and they are dressed from head to toe in protective equipment. And there are people who are walking about as if uh, it's, you know, any, any time of year and nothing's going on. And it's, it's a bit alarming sometimes to, to see them uh, behaving in that way. So I certainly know plenty of people who think that the entire COVID crisis is overblown and a hoax. Their opinions have changed when they themselves or a family member have become ill. Right. I find it really disturbing when I see stories um, like the barber in Texas or the tattoo parlor 
where they're completely flouting local health regulations and uh, you know providing services without appropriate social distancing and actually even hiring their own armed guards to keep the police away and you know, I've had many conversations with family and friends about what should happen if those people then become ill like where's the personal responsibility um, in that you know are they still or should they still present to the emergency department and then expose those frontline EMT workers and emergency department workers um, because they have completely ignored what all the experts are saying. And that becomes a bit of an ethical dilemma. Obviously, yeah. you know, our oath is to take care of everybody, you know, no matter what they've done. But when you're putting yourself in harm's way, it just reframes the question a little bit. So I, I personally find it very disturbing when people completely ignore what are really just common sense recommendations, yeah. but also based on science. Right. Well, you know, uh, it, this does remind me a little bit of the HIV uh, pandemic in the sense that uh, it's not an exact comparison, but uh, people were advised to use uh, condoms when they were having sex to prevent the spread or to have a, you know, participate in needle exchange program. And sometimes the attitudes were very similar uh, in, in what you just described. They might not have been quite as dramatic uh, as, you know, what you depicted with hiring armed guards to uh, keep the police away, but they were, they were pretty confrontational at times and people felt they had the right to, you know, act out in ways that they, they wanted to, and, and it, was, uh, it was their choice. But of course, uh, what would happen later was uh, they were responsible either for infecting or being infected. And um, I imagine at that time, they, they might present themselves to you. Yeah, I think the difference is it was pretty easy as a healthcare worker not to get HIV. Um, right. And mercifully, transmission to healthcare workers from needle sticks has always been extremely unusual. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas the healthcare risk to the population in general from COVID, as we've seen, um, you know, is, is much, much greater. So right now there's about, what, 40,000 people in the U.S. who are living with HIV infection and, you know, over a million and a half people um, in the U.S. who've been infected with COVID. So the numbers are, you know, quite, quite different. You didn't find that you felt the same type of disturbing uh, reaction to people? Um, I didn't ever feel personally at risk of getting HIV infection, even, right. you know, as a, as a house officer when the numbers of people that we took care of with HIV were staggering. And it was you know, obviously over many, many years, and whereas the COVID epidemic hopefully will be much shorter than that. Or the COVID pandemic, we much sure right. um, We were speaking before about you know the nurses on the front line and some of the other uh, people who are not recognized, and um, I was curious if you've had a chance to talk with them on a personal level and find out what the impact is in terms of how they're dealing with their families. And, uh, yeah, so I think there's a very diverse um, set of responses. Um, you know, I think most of the nurses um, are going home to their families. There are few who um, are concerned about uh, family members who may be particularly vulnerable, who are not staying with their families. But in general, I think people have a lot of faith in their PPE um, and are just you know, pretty much going home and showering and being with their families. And it's really important at this time to have that connection um, from family. And so um, I don't know a lot of nurses personally who've been, you know, staying at a hotel and not, be, not being with their families. Um, and a lot of my interactions right now um, are now in our outpatient settings where I know our nurses are going home. I imagine some of them also are uh, doing double duty as mom and nurse and uh, having to help with the uh, homeschooling, which is wrapping up for everyone now. Yes, yeah, so I've actually spoken with several of my colleagues about how they're doing um, and how their kids are doing. 
and it's incredibly challenging you know with nothing else going on to be a working parent and then you you know take away the fact that the kids are physically leaving home and going to school where you have you know a teacher managing it for much of the day so most of my friends who are trying to supervise their kids doing homeschooling are really struggling with that and feeling very appreciative of what it is that teachers do um, and their kids are are antsy um, one of my colleagues shared with me a story that she took her young daughter out to the beach to go and play and when they got back home um, her child basically staged a sit down strike saying I am not going back into that house I've spent too much time in the house and I'm not going back inside yeah <laughs> that makes sense to me yeah, I totally I completely completely get that I think everyone would at this at this well right. most people would I would say right. um, how how have you been impacted yourself you 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 have adult children if, if I'm not mistaken so you, you're not coming home to uh, correct I mean my my children are either in college or out of college um, right. and so they're uh, you know very independent um, I feel really badly for them. I think it's really hard to get pulled out of college and have to come back home and yeah. live with mom and dad. Um, and I mean, I certainly have many family members who've been impacted. I have a nephew who had to cancel his wedding, a daughter who missed out on her college commencement, cousin whose wife lost both of her parents within a week um, from COVID, and just, you know, of course, what I see um, at work. Yeah, so it's, it, I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of uh, peripheral uh, disturbing experiences as well as, you know, dealing with the interruption in your own children's uh, life and that sort of thing in, in your life as well. How are you handling it? How are you doing well, I, mean, I have a great support system, and I have been absolutely inundated with support um, from friends and colleagues. And I have the incredible <laughs> good fortune of working with, an amazing group of people. Um, my coworkers are absolutely spectacular. Um, one of my coworkers, unfortunately, was one of the few healthcare workers who was um, uh, infected with COVID and you know was in the hospital for a while. Unfortunately, you know is is doing fine. Um, but our group really pulls together. We have all gotten pulled to do backup coverage um, on COVID wards unexpectedly, and I mean, everybody's just pulled together and banded together and my friends have just come out of the woodwork and so that helps a lot and my kids have been absolutely amazing I could come home from work very late and they will have made dinner and my husband's cleaning up after dinner and so I, I'm extremely fortunate to have such a good support system so that's actually very inspiring and uh, uh, something I think that's a it's a nice place for us to um, pause um, because I, I would like for people to, to think about that and to think about how we actually um, can come together uh, for each other, um, which, is, which is really the, the premise of what we're doing right now and, and us talking and connecting, and trying to reach people and, and have them feel uh, that they're actually participating in this as well. Um, so um, thank you. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk with, with me today. My pleasure. Thank you. Stay safe. You too. Be well.